So I'd like to welcome the first uh, participants of the webinar. I can see that more and more people are joining. So I will give a minute or two for the participants to join the discussion. When you reach 50. Uh, we are more, beyond, but I see okay. the, the number you, you, is... In, you, you, you can wait. I think the number is increasing quickly. I will take the opportunity to share my screen in the meanwhile. All right. Good. I think uh, we are ready to start the discussion. I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, UNIDO webinar on smart quality infrastructure, shaping a sustainable future. We're very pleased that you're here with us today. Before we start the very interesting discussion, I'd like to remind you of some housekeeping rules. So we will have a lively panel discussion with four panelists today. If you have any questions related to the topic, then please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will try to answer uh, as many questions as we can after the discussion. We'd like to apologize in advance if time does not permit to uh, to get back to all the questions that we will receive. Um, for more information on this session and uh, any information around the topic, please visit the UNIDO Knowledge Hub under hub.unido.org. This is where you will also find the recordings of this session and any re related material in um, the next couple of days. Without any further delay, I'd like to introduce our honorable speakers today. We do have with us uh, a, a very renowned names, starting with Roberta Gerasimchuk. She's a program manager of strategy and PMO at ISO. It's very good to have you here with us, Roberta. We have also Brahim Hula. He's the accreditation service director at the GG, G, GCC Accreditation Center. And he's also a communications and marketing committee chair at the IAF. Uh, welcome, Brahim. Also joining us today is Stefano Sedola. He is a chief technical advisor for the Markup Kenya project and the Qualidon project, both for UNIDO. We also have with us Aparna Dawan, Executive Director of the TIC Council. And this uh, session will be moderated by Bernardo Caltadia Sarmiento, who is the Director of Fair Production, Sustainability Standards and Trade at UNIDO. So uh, we're very pleased to have you all here with us today. Welcome to the discussion. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand the floor to Bernardo. Bernardo, the floor is yours. Uh -huh. Uh, a warm welcome to all the participants. Thank you for the speakers to spending uh, some time in this busy period. And uh, before going on to uh, 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 the, 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 the discussion and, and what I will do, I will set the scene. Uh, next slide, please. I also would like to mention that it's, it's, it's a great occasion. Uh, we are launching also today the publication on smart quality infrastructure shaping a sustainable future. Uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, and going to be available at the knowledge app, unido.org. So this is uh, a, a, a coming out of the press, coming out of the oven. Uh, a big thanks to, to all the contributors, in particular, Daniele Gerundino, Nigel Croft, and Leopoldo Colombo, as well as uh, Sean McCarthy and Mara Rolando, that really helped us to shape the document. Next slide, please unless you want to say something on the document, Dorina? No, I think uh, we're very happy that we are able to launch this today and we encourage everybody to look at the document online. It is already available on uh, the Knowledge Hub, hub.unido.org. And I will also share the link um, to the document in the chat in a minute. So uh, so we keep it that you, uh, you, you, you will keep the presentation, I will not share mine. Uh, and uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, looking back, uh, what we have tried to, to, to do is to, uh, uh, first of all, 
see how standardization accompanied the industrialization process from mechanization, electrification, or automation, digitalization. And obviously, we had this concept of the fourth industrial revolution, the cyber physical systems, the merging of the new technologies, uh, and uh, what is coming next, the quantum computer. So it gives a, a broad overview, but in this broad overview of, of uh, uh, starting with health, safety, risk, and working conditions, interoperability, and convergence of the new technologies, we wanted to put a strong emphasis in sustainability. Uh, this is very important that this new process that is the technological transformation of also of the QI leads us to uh, a, a sustainability imperative, what we can call it. Next slide, please. Uh, so we, we have followed the, the systemic approach, and I will not elaborate in this, but we have gone through each of the uh, uh, pillars of uh, QI and, and made the analysis. Next. And this you can see here that we went into uh, the, the smart technology elements, smart standardization, accreditation, smart conformity assessment. I was uh, very happy to see a, a tweet this morning from in Metro. They are migrating into a, a certificate system for gas pumps. Uh, we have been working with them on this type of elements, on discussing what is the, this, uh, 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 they call it in Metro 4.0 and all this transformation. Uh, obviously, I will not take you through, but we, we, we know that in metrology, there is increased demand on measurement data, uh, metrological inspe inspection data, uh, touchless calibration. In standardization, we have here ISO, so I will not elaborate. Uh, we will hear from the smart standards, uh, smart accreditation, remote assessment. We have also a publication on that, but this is where this publication dives in. Uh, blockchain technologies, e-certificates, and where uh, a lot of things are happening also uh, in uh, conformity assessment, in particular uh, in relation to inspection, to remote auditing, the use of new technologies. Next slide. Uh, so we, we, we know that uh, the uh, quality is responding also to a number of elements that we, we have uh, found uh, and we have agreed to use the concept of quality 4.0, smart quality, which is precisely the pre-programmed corrections, the machine learning, advanced robotics, Internet of Things, very important. Uh, internet of everything and the automatic decision making process, uh, which is going to bring about also a lot of changes in the type of uh, skills that we will require. Next. And uh, we have dived in also uh, in the issue of the supply chain. Uh, we have been uh, witnessing the digitalization of the supply chain and are insisting that we are uh, uh, having this process of uh, mass customization, but we need also to make sure that we are following a sustainability approach to the supply chain that takes into account environmental and uh, inclusiveness issues, including human rights, decent jobs, uh, etc. Next slide. Uh, what I mentioned before, we will have a lot of skills that will be uh, uh, needed in order to, 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 to be able to uh, cope with this change in quality infrastructure, in quality itself, and uh, we will see that the, these new professionals will need to support digital transformation, redesign system, translate big, big data, uh, and uh, there will be continuous skills and capacity building. And I hope our, our uh, participants, our speakers can elaborate also on the threats that is bringing about. Next. So the future trends uh, are definitely the, the manufacturing and, and services will com converge based on market demands. Manufacturers will redefine their processes around new technologies. Uh, hybrid human machine processes are on the rise. Manufacturing will incorporate more automated systems, uh, intelligent systems, and there will be a manufacturing uh, culture to embrace digital. And this is also going to uh, bring new 
challenges, new opportunities. I think that the challenges that we have to, to really put forward is the sustainability imperative, and then uh, the more operational ones that probably are related to security, to cyber security, but they are bringing opportunities. With these new technologies, with new trends, many things are changing. That is even the question, what will be the future of accreditation, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So with, with that introduction, uh, and this was just to set the scene and, 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 and look back a bit on the, at, 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 at the document, uh, I would like to, to uh, uh, start the, uh, the, the discussion. Um, and um, my first question would go to uh, ISO, uh, Roberta. Uh, uh, Roberta, uh, as mentioned, digital transformation is entering into all spheres of life. This calls for uh, adequate standards in many areas. Uh, that ensure the classical role of standards, interoperability and safety. But how are standards evolving to meet the digital needs of the future? What role standards will play in digital transformation process? And certainly also, what is ISO doing in this regard? Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Bernard, and thanks a lot for inviting us. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you today. So uh, I would like to start uh, responding with um, our perception of digitalization. So at ISO, we see digitalization as a tool that will help bring new efficiencies in delivering the value for people, actually for users and for manufacturers, for consumers, and so on, for, so for, so for the variety of stakeholders. And according to ISO vision, uh, making lives uh, easier, safer, and better, uh, which kind of reflects uh, our people-centric and value-driven approach. This is along these lines, uh, we're structuring uh, the program we're currently doing uh, at ISO in collaboration with uh, IEC, which is called SMART program. So SMART stands for Standards, a Machine Applicable, Readable, and Transferable. And that is where we're trying to identify the necessary tools, processes, uh, to support uh, this digital transformation and to support new deliverables. Uh, to the question of how standards are evolving, what we currently observe is that uh, there is a need, again, from the end users um, uh, from, from, and from the variety of stakeholders to perceive um, standards more as an actionable content. So we see this gradual move from standard as a document to standard as an actionable content or even a standard as a service uh, to a certain extent. And around these lines, um, we're trying to build uh, the program uh, that I currently mentioned. So we launched the SMART program end of last year. Uh, we have established this collaboration uh, with IEC uh, in 2021. Uh, so we have uh, joint uh, groups working on collecting uh, the use cases, on uh, analyzing the business models, uh, the conformity assessment uh, implications and aspects, and also we're aligning uh, on the technology side. Uh, so the way we're approaching uh, digital transformation, the way we're um, preparing uh, to grow our digital capabilities um, of standard developing organizations and also how we support our members uh, in this regard. So this is in a nutshell what we're doing, how we're perceiving the digital needs. We try to just to call them needs. Uh, and then eventually what we want to see is the re real delivery of new value for, uh, for people to make their lives uh, easier, safer and better. Thank you so much. And in, in, in this regard, where, where we are seeing also uh, much more uh, digital uh, dominance and di digital uh, elements in the preparation of the uh, uh, and, 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 and the development of the standards, one question that is coming, and I, I have been observing a lot what is going on uh, in Germany, for example, by Dean, where uh, there is more and more the, the, the utilization of algorithms uh, in order to 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 develop the standard. Do you think? Uh, and let me, uh, uh, because of the today we are celebrating this publication and we are trying to 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 dive deep into the future. Do you think that one day standards may be developed only by artificial intelligence? Uh, that's an excellent question, Bernardo. And if uh, maybe some of you are aware, uh, the recently uh, released uh, chat GPT by OpenAI. So basically. Um, 
uh, we were all, you know, testing here uh, this, this question. And um, so what we did, we actually we asked AI the question, uh, if the standards are uh, going to be developed by AI. And uh, here's the response. Uh, it's possible that AI will play a role in the development of standards in the future, but it's unlikely that standards will be developed entirely by AI. Standards are often developed through a collaborative process involving experts uh, in a particular field, and it's difficult to imagine a scenario in which AI could replace the knowledge and expertise of these individuals. Additionally, the development of standards is often influenced by social and cultural factors that are difficult for AI to take into account. So as weird as it may sound, is the response of AI to the question of, of if AI is going to uh, actually take over the standardization world? And uh, we might say that we concur with, with this response in those three questions, in those three sentences only. Thank you so much. And yes, I was trying to, to provoke, but let's move from standards a bit to, to what is going on in, in other areas, uh, accreditation, for example, and, and, and accreditation is another area where especially in COVID times also, we have seen digital transformation has happened. COVID has uh, brought about a, a new uh, push to digital transformation, and we have seen new assessment techniques evolving. But the question is, what are uh, the most important advancement, technological advancement in accreditation, and uh, uh, how it will going to change uh, how quality assurance is working? Uh, Brahim, uh, uh, the question yes was... sure bernardo absolutely uh, so in the accreditation community uh, we recognize that the digital transformation is going to change the way we work like before the pandemic maybe the pandemic made it uh, fast but uh, since then we have uh, three kinds of changes so there's the changes in our um, customers our clients the conform assessment bodies and the industry there's a change in the way we do the work and we do accreditation and assessments but also there's a change even in our way of making capacity building so firstly we have seen a number of waves of uh, digital transformation so the first wave is uh, uh, obviously the ICT the smart glasses augmented reality telepresence Mm -hmm. all those technologies that we have also we've seen that in first wave that for conform assessment activities they use uh, for example inspection with drones with uh, satellite technology satellite navigation sometimes also we have the eye tracking technology so those are the uh, first wave that we have but really the second wave that's really affecting the way we are working is about using artificial intelligence and data analysis because that really makes the big change that for us and that we need to adapt to it and be in, in phase to it. So this is a major factor for us uh, in accreditation conformity assessment. We have a lot of data that we usually do not use after the uh, certificate. So we don't gather that data and we analyze it. But imagine how uh, the uh, systems using uh, artificial intelligence and uh, advanced data analysis that can maybe in the future predict the issues that can happen in systems. So we, before we go to the audit, we'll be seeing how the, uh, the that the company is going to work or that uh, uh, product can have failures in the future before we make the type approval and before the design is there. So these are things that uh, really are go, going to change the way uh, we work. So for example, also now that we have uh, these new techniques and new methods uh, of auditing and assessing, the real question is not anymore, are we going to make it on site or virtual or combined? The real question is going to be humans or is it going to be AI or a combination of humans and AI? The question also is not, or is it going to be on site or remote, but also it's going to be, uh, is it going to be a, 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 a real organization or is it a digital twin of that organization? Maybe that's more impartial when we do that. Maybe it's uh, more effective to do uh, such work. So these are things that really challenging us in the work we do. So that's an example for certification, but we can see the same when we have automated testing, uh, touchless calibration, uh, uh, digital designs and simulations, inspection, uh, AI-led processes that are assessed. All these are things that really need us to, uh, as a community for accreditation and conformity assessment, to adapt so that we can stay relevant. I give you also the example on the, th the third level where we are also challenged and uh, uh, changing and modifying the way the work is the capacity building uh, and training activities. We used to have the face-to-face, -face, 
with the first wave, we moved, we moved to the webinars and uh, uh, online training and e-learning. Now we are moving to another place where uh, we use the uh, um, asynchronous uh, uh, training, but uh, we also go to virtual realities and metaverses. So you do not need a laboratory to go and train your assessors. You can create a lab on a metaverse. You can put equipments and with a click, you can change that laboratory from a microbiology laboratory to a chemical lab, to a petroleum lab, to electrical lab. And then you can have your assessors make those uh, uh, work. So maybe uh, the most important thing that we understood is not really about the technology itself, is mostly about the skills and the knowledge that need to be developed in that field so that you can embrace that technology and then also be adaptable to do it. And just to finish here, I say that maybe for our children who are playing PlayStation every day and they have those uh, uh, skills on PlayStation, maybe that's a useful skill in the future if you'd like to be an assessor because you know already the metaverse and virtual reality. Okay, you are really thinking of the future, next generation. It was great. Thank you so much for, for visualizing how, how, how many technologies are coming and how fast these processes are going. Uh, it, it, it is amazing. And also, you brought a, a bit, and, and, and it seems that we're converging with the notion of AI becoming more predominant and, and then thinking what, what will be the limits and, and what will be go. And, and, and while we see a lot of opportunities, we have also... Uh, a, a, a lot of, 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 of challenges and eventually uh, uh, risk. And uh, this uh, leads me to, to Aparna. I would like to, 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 to ask you, uh, and, and you are coming more from, from the private sector, from the uh, Testing Inspection Council, and you are looking more uh, uh, from a different perspective. So where do you see the, 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 the risk coming in this uh, new technological advancement? And how can they uh, be mitigated? How can we prepare so that these processes uh, are smooth and are uh, also uh, 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 maintaining people at the center? Because it's scary what uh, uh, also Brahim was saying that one day the, the, the human factor will be minimized. So uh, to you, Avarna. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bhandatu. And I would also like to take this opportunity on behalf of Tech Council to thank UNIDO as well as Dr. Bernardo to give us this opportunity. Uh, so when we look into the conformity assessment sector, what we see is it's pretty wide sector, if you know. It has everything like food and agri products, health sector, heavy industries, environment. So there's quite a lot of diversification uh, of uh, activities in the sector. And when we talk about digitization of the processes, there are a lot of activities which will have to be considered uh, to be considered under this because um, uh, considering the wide variety, you will have internal processes, there are communications, business activities, uh, likewise, and so on. So uh, something as small as uh, uh, a collection of a sample till the time the report is released from a lab, will have a lot of activities which will have to be taken up internally to ensure that it is foolproof. Uh, all digital methodologies are performed. IoT and AI being used at the maximum level as possible, of course, as, um, uh, as, as informed by um, Roberta, human interface would always continue to be there. They cannot, we cannot just go away with that. So when we talk about risks uh, in this sector, I see there are a um, series of them which can be considered. One is you look into the complexity of processes, as I just mentioned. So uh, in order to digitalize the activities of tech sector, there is a lot of investment which will be required in digital apps, dashboards, platforms, so to make customer <laughs> engagement easier. So to, to, to undertake that, uh, there has to be an appropriate digital strategy with the organization to ensure that the investment and the finances which are used in it do not go um, futile. Second and the most important thing in today's scenario is the knowledge of the person. It is very important that people have their adequate skill set because even though we may have the best technologies and we don't implement them, it goes waste. So what is actually re required is you have skilled people who are continuously learning, developing new processes, understanding new technologies, innovating, so that we have maximum output from that 
from them which is seen. But if you look at the scenario, uh, considering the if if we were to look look into LinkedIn, the total number of posts advertised would be less than one percent in the tech uh, sector, which required for knowledge of digital technology or terms related to sale. So there is a need that we upgrade the knowledge and the skill of the people in digital world. Then coming to one of the most critical issues, which all of us are aware about, is the data protection and the IT security management. So at Tech Council, we had done a study uh, to find out that the size of the global IoT consumer market is expected to grow uh, to from $53 billion in 2019 to $188 billion in 2027. Imagine, it's almost going to go three times. So the consumer products with internet capability functionality will present to be a hurdle. And what is most important is to protect your homes and your activity loved ones from the cyber criminals. So it is very important that we focus on good cloud management practices and organizations will have to host vital data of the organization probably in ways so that it is protected because cyber security and cyber attacks are going to increase. I can just give you an update from my economy uh, for the last week news which happened was one of the topmost medical institute has been under cyber attack. And the institute is actually struggling to manage the um, you know, the patients as well as their data. So cyber security is a key aspect because, and there have to be adequate data protection tools which have to be applied so that there is a robust cyber secure ecosystem which is set up, be it for accreditation, be it for standards, be it for conformity assessment. So irrespective of whether we are a developing economy or there's a developed economy, cyber security framework will have to be uh, uh, will have to be strengthened and it is going to be the utmost important thing which needs to be focused by any organization. Uh, besides that, of course, there are other risks which um, can be considered as um, if you look into some of the economies, there is this weak public digital infrastructure, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity issues and all those things. Then currently, as you said at the beginning, there is a need to develop uniform standards, which can be globally practiced. Um, then there has to be a digital strategy, which needs to be implemented by the top management, which is actually important uh, so that it looks into the organization agility and looks into operation options for collaboration. Again, that's something very, very important for us to look into. Collaboration would be another aspect because it's new technology, new terms, new activities which are going to be coming up. Uh, so when we talk about risk, these are few of the aspects which will actually require main focus and attention by not just conformity assessment bodies of the tech sector, but across two different uh, organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, 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 and we had also a very deep uh, 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 elaboration on, 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 on where the challenges are. But thank you also because you elaborated also on, on, on what can be the mitigating factors. You talked about investment, about people about data integrity, about collaboration, and, and, and indeed uh, uh, we will need to, to, to have new, 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 new skills, uh, uh, data integrity and all, all the cybersecurity challenge and all what we can do in, in, in relation to the cloud are there and, and, and collaboration uh, is also fundamental to continue a path of uh, partnerships and also on maintaining the integrity of the of the multilateral trading system, I would say, because uh, accreditation and quality infrastructure are an essential part of this. And if we don't maintain uh, collaboration, we cannot maintain trust. I'm sure that uh, Brahim would more than agree with me yeah. on the need for trust and maintaining the trust in, in what is uh, I would say the, the, the quality infrastructure business. And uh, when we talk about um, uh, uh, about uh, uh, these opportunities and challenge and we look at the risk and difficulties, we need to think about developing countries. 
uh, for developing countries. And I'm not thinking uh, in big countries. You are coming uh, from bigger economies. I'm thinking for smaller economies. And 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 we have Stefano who has been working for so many years in 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 Africa. But now at present he is very active in in Kenya and Tanzania. And uh, he can give us a a, a fresh uh, perception of. Well, the, the 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 struggle of 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 developing countries with these new technologies with quality infrastructure services so in 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 that uh, uh, perspective of 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 the most difficult part for developing countries because i see all the elements that were mentioned are not there in developing countries but what do you think is critical in the part for uh, industrial in, in industrial development uh, stefano to you Thank you, Bernardo, um, for, for having me here in, in this panel. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to uh, describe my experience from the developing countries and what are the struggles they are using new technologies. I think there, there are many struggles that starts from the, the infrastructure, the, the access to, uh, to uh, power supply. But I'm not going to focus on the macro uh, elements. I'm going to try to look, uh, narrow down my, my experience to something very specific, which uh, we encounter in some of our uh, projects. That actually is the need uh, to uh, translate the business and societal needs into the right technology solutions, rather than uh, pushing technology per se. There is always a problem to solve. So we, I think that from a developing country perspective is to start from the problem. And also there is typically a cost associated with new technologies. And we need to find ways uh, for lower this cost for more sustainable digital transformation. Uh, now, and, and here I want to, my key message here is that beyond hardware, data and data exchanges, are also part of the digital transformation. And so we need to explore ways to go beyond hardware, considering data and data exchange as part of digital transformation. And in this case, we were in Kenya, we are discussing and working on smart uh, uh, farming. And uh, uh, sometimes data are not considered as part of smart farming, but they are, uh, because by having additional data, the farmer is able to implement timely and target strategies to prevent production losses and increase uh, cost, increased costs. Uh, I want to give you three examples that somehow are uh, maybe uh, that help, could help, and are helping smallholders and are related about data sharing. Weather forecasting via smartphone is not something that people may automatically associate with smart farming, but it can have a profound effect on uh, the decision making by farmers. This includes weather radars or uh, severe event warnings, for example, for flood or storm forecasting, that can provide the smallholders uh, with enough time to move the herds to a higher ground or protect or harvest their crops. A second example is that how smartphone can be used to warn farmers uh, on biosecurity risks. Uh, consider a small holders of, uh, of goats, for example, who receives a notification of a potential disease or uh, outbreak in her area and uh, via the smartphone, she can decide to stop grazing uh, a common area rather than uh, uh, take the risk of infecting her um, herds or similarly to identify the possible pest affecting uh, a crop, uh, um, such as plant mites, for example. A, a third example is that the, the same technology and data can be used to enhance trade options for small holders. Imagine that uh, the same uh, small holder has uh, six uh, liters of gold milk uh, to sell today. She can send notification to potential buyers of milk and bid. Uh, they can bid for her product and she can select to sell the buyer that is closer to her. Uh, greater access to market can significantly transform, be transformational for the small holders. And, uh, and so whether it is responding weather forecast, marketing a product uh, or responding to a disease or a pest outbreak, these are all examples of how data sharing solution can help uh, small holders. 
And I think uh, uh, we need to give more uh, relevance uh, uh, to how we, uh, we harvest data, how we exchange data, and how we address the data governance in developing countries. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you, 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 you put uh, very clearly your, your, your messages on data. But thank you so much for bringing us to, 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 to reality, bringing us to the challenges of the smallholders, bringing us to, to, to really to, 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 as you call, smart farming, but what, what does it mean? And the challenges that are accompanying, even if you have a smartphone, uh, but also you mentioned the, 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 the big possibilities to access markets, be it national markets or uh, uh, even international markets, uh, a, a, an important role for data. And let me go back to Aparna uh, in, 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 in this complexity of problems and solutions. We have seen that technology will lead to a lot of efficiency gains. Uh, we have no doubt. And this is where, where, where the, the hesitation comes because looking into the future, uh, we want that uh, these efficiency gains are not predominantly uh, 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 at, uh, going at the expense of, of other important causes. Uh, uh, we mentioned the, the imperative of sustainability, of social inclusion, uh, and of all the today uh, existing uh, 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 environmental challenges, even in the Amazon, we, we see deforestation, etc. How can we balance out because obviously the, the industry will be looking at the efficiency gains. Yeah, Bernardo, uh, I think I completely agree with you. So in this scenario, whatever we are facing, it is very, very important that um, um, efficiency gains do not happen at the cost of um, important causes, you know, especially sustainability being one of them. Uh, just to cite to you, uh, I can uh, start with an example. Um, the COVID era, the pandemic era, what, what happened was uh, in the conformity assessment framework, there used to be on-site audits. And then we had to innovate to new ways. Of, obviously, there were remote assessment activities happening, but then the entire audit system got shifted for that one year period of uh, pandemic into the remote assessment part of it. Now, what happened was when initially this whole exercise began, um, not just to one economy, but I can say globally, there were certain challenges which happened um, because effective time management was required to be done. The assessor had to be trained, um, effective tools had to be used. So all these things were to be done. So once this whole exercise began and the processes started, uh, people began looking into the uh, effective gains of the remote assessment. Time management, as I mentioned, was one of them. Uh, there was a reduction in the travel and the risks associated um, with the uh, uh, hazard on site. There was a uh, reduction in the environmental footprint because people were not traveling. Uh, it was easy to conduct assessments in the areas which were even difficult to access. Uh, but then uh, uh, there were drawbacks pertaining to the ways uh, the remote assessment had to be conducted what was the technological infrastructure. Uh, there was changes into time zone management, which had to be taken care about. And then uh, there were other ways in which not appropriate remote techniques could be used. I can cite an example. We were witnessing uh, a remote assessment. And um, in one of the case of uh, uh, the client, everything, the, the technique and the methodologies were too advanced and it it went with the very smooth flow. In another case, even something as Wi-Fi connectivity became a hurdle. Now, these were the challenges. So now we had to come out with a solution. So uh, people have come out with a solution. There have been guidance documents from IF and the regional bodies on it. People have come out with effective, efficient ways to do it. Even at the council, we have published a white paper on the remote assessment techniques, wherein we have highlighted what are the drawbacks and what are the measures which need to be taken for an effective uh, remote assessment. And looking into what today, what we can say is a balance between remote and face-to-face -face methods are the best ways to adapt to the technology. So likewise, when we talk about digitization um, practices, as I mentioned, there's a need to have a digital strategy 
Uh, and when you have a digital strategy, what is essential is a couple of three factors which can be considered in it. Considered in it. Uh, one thing which I feel is you connect everything. Because if I have to mention from a tech sector or, for example, a lab front, wherein there are different processes, instruments, people, systems, consumables, it is what is important is you have an automated end-to-end -end flow to improve uh, the productivity. And for this, it is important that you uh, connect and share all the information, merge it, uh, link it to the data, collaborate with each other. Now, because once this happens, um, the connectivity part of it happens effectively um, using the digital technologies of AI or IoT, you will get an integrated flow of high quality data, uh, which can be observed on a dashboard and this will help improvise the activity. Then when I say improvise the activity, we can look into the second aspect, which is improving the connectivity. So when we talk about improving the connectivity, uh, there was a survey conducted by a global lab uh, wherein they said 67% said that the efforts in their laboratories at the scale was hindered by their current laboratory equipment. And 71% said the laboratory software where was preventing these efforts. So now to do so, what is actually important is we use appropriate sensors, we use augmented reality, or we use appropriate methodology so that these challenges can be addressed. And when you are able to improve the connectivity, what will happen is in one snapshot, you have a data visualization, which is there. For example, a heat map of instrument utilization, you're able to see. And then once you see a heat map, you see, okay, these are the gaps. It's not been utilized. This has been underutilized. Then you improve your assets and you improvise your strategic activity such that there is maximization gain of the current lab operation. So technology will have to be utilized to ensure that, uh, that adequate data is used uh, by digitalization, appropriate understanding is done so that lab-wide visibility is observed. In addition to that, there is a need to implement the advanced analytics part of it. And uh, my recommendation also would be that looking into the current scenario, if we go into a broader prospect of activities, there is a need that we develop a robust regulatory framework um, to address the different concerns. Uh, for example, if you have, if we are all aware of the new Cyber Resilience Act, which is being implemented by EU, um, there is a need wherein we develop activities uh, and regulatory framework in, to, in the area of digital personal data protection, because these are the two areas which, as I mentioned earlier, are going to be the focus and where we will have to ensure that the uh, processes are being utilized appropriately. Uh, there could be a need to improvise uh, competences, competences, uh, and of course, looking into the way we are we are globalized, there is a need to implement harmonized protocols so that we are able to coordinate effectively and, as mentioned, uh, reduce the carbon footprint. Because at the end, we are all looking into the sustainable part of uh, digitalization. Exactly. I think we, we need to focus on, on the net zero. We need to, yeah. to, to, to focus on, on global collaboration. And the net zero brings us to, to, to standards, back to standards, because uh, I, I, I know that ISO was at, at, at COP27 and launched the, 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 uh, the, the, the definition, the guidance document with the definition. On net zero, you have the London Declaration. But the question is, how, how, how can the standards take a proactive role in the future? And at this speed, and, uh, I, it was very visual uh, today of this technological acceleration with a lot of, 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 of balances we have to take. And uh, uh, the question is, how can uh, standards uh, uh, play a role to ensure sustainability is not left aside and remains in the focus of our attention? Roberta, please. 
Thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for the question, Bernard. And it's true that uh, we have announced uh, net zero guidelines uh, just at the COP27 a couple of weeks ago. So that's a huge uh, next uh, milestone in our sustainability commitment. And uh, as you know, uh, all the standards, uh, they contribute to the SDGs. And uh, with this regard, what smart standard or digital standards, uh, they can help understand better this impact on SDGs, this contribution to sustainability. And uh, additionally, uh, what is important is to understand that uh, currently standards provide framework for the development and implementation of new technologies and practices, and they help ensure that these technologies and practices are developed in a way that is safe, efficient, and um, by participating actually uh, in standardization organizations and individuals can help shape uh, this uh, future innovation, innovative technologies, and what smart standards or digital standards will provide is new opportunities actually for the feedback, for the uh, input or feedback loop, as we call it, uh, into standard development from the end users, uh, from the consumers, uh, from everyone who is uh, participating in the process of this new digital standard creation, but also in the usage of it. So that, that is the main uh, the main point, I think, from uh, from our smart uh, perspective, smart standards perspective. And, 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 and to Stefano, a similar perspective, uh, uh, looking into the future, uh, how can we ensure that uh, digital transformation uh, of uh, QI and uh, QI in, in, in each element of the system can really serve the bigger cause? Uh, con uh, contributing to our sustainability paradigm. And this time, please, and you did so well, uh, the perspective of the developing countries. Yeah. Thank you, Bernardo. Uh, sustainability is an imperative for all the UNIDO project and uh, included those I'm involved in. And, uh, and uh, within UNIDO, there is a clear vision uh, that low tech delivery mechanism needs to be encouraged along with the high level technology. And, and this will uh, eventually support uh, human capital development. So my call for action is that uh, to put emphasis on the at the design level of the inter uh, capacity building program to to encourage a low tech delivery mechanism to be uh, to be accelerated using uh, uh, new technologies that answer specific uh, uh, needs. And so I'll give you an example how we uh, from our low tech delivery technical assistance project in uh, like uh, the one in uh, in Tanzania that is uh, basically to to build capacity on uh, on a, for an institution actually we try we, we we use technology to accelerate the, the 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 pace of the capacity building and to reduce the cost of compliance give you two examples one is with laboratory management information system which is nothing complicated but uh, uh, it, it enable to uh, to reduce the cost of compliance, uh, helping with the large volume of laboratory data, its management and uh, adherence to the strict standards that uh, while improving the efficiency and the turnaround time in particular, enabling the automation of the relevant uh, uh, protocols within the laboratories. So simple uh, digital uh, um, application can uh, enable to reduce the cost of compliance. Or another example uh, that uh, the use of our QR code system for market surveillance and traceability uh, that provides basically the, the, the users of uh, this application possibility of scanning a QR code on a product using a smartphone camera. The result of the scan is communicated to the smartphone uh, the, the smartphone reads QR code, it's sent uh, to the cloud, it matches with the database of uh, products, and it communicates the result to the operators, and the data are tracked in real time, made available on dashboard, and, and, uh, and enabled to verify the validity of a, of a quality mark uh, placed on the market. These are uh, simple applications that can uh, uh, be incorporated in any a type of technical assistance project. Uh, and so as a sustainability is a, our imperative, uh, I, I, I remind, I go back to the key message that is low tech delivery mechanism needs to be encouraged alongside with high level technologies that will accelerate the digital transformation of developing countries. 
Thank you so much, and, and, and also to, to to balance because this is what we need is 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 is, is to support uh, the, the developing countries to receive uh, the, the the right technologies, information gathering, and to ensure these spillovers. Uh, I would like to to go back to to Brahim and and and, and say, okay, what what will be needed, and and uh, moving to action now because uh, we talked a lot, but now we need to, to look what can we do more in action, uh, uh, how we can contribute, Rahim. Exactly, Bernardo. I think this is the, the most important point when uh, in the different levels of accreditation at the regional level, I like IF level, but also at the international network of uh, international organizations level, also this is being discussed. The most important is the word you have said before is trust. We need to uh, apply, uh, digital transformation, but still keep trust in what we do. So we don't need, uh, as uh, Stefano said, to, to digitalize everything. We need to have a wisely planned strategy for uh, the uh, capacity building and digitalization, but also having the trust of regulators and users in this audits are not as trustful as the on-site. So that's why our digital transformation needs to focus on how to deliver that. So for example, at the uh, organizations, at the Arab uh, Accreditation Corporation, for example, we have a digitalization transformation project that helped a number of accreditation bodies to uh, have a software uh, uh, similar to what Stefano was um, uh, describing, but for accreditation bodies, when they have their application until the certificate of accreditation in the software, with the different processes digitalized, and then the accreditation body saves a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of efficiency by using uh, that software. Uh, the international organizations, I like NAF also, IAF had uh, its own digital transformation uh, project, and it digitalized all its procedures and its processes on the website and also allowed for different developing economies to be able to reach for the first time forums of discussions, have their opinions and get access to information and to how they digitalize their own processes. But also this is an important pillar also being discussed at the international network INETQI and also the uh, regional quality infrastructure networks that they put projects uh, in support of uh, um, UNIDU and other international organizations where technical support projects have a focus on digitalization in, as I said, wisely planned manner. So the trade potential for developing economies is really related to how trustful is the quality infrastructure digitalization and digital transformation adds to that trust because of the fairness and for the clarity and for the data and transparency that adds to that infrastructure. And that's why I think this is a real focus for the uh, support projects that need to be developed for the developing economies uh, so that we can really uh, ensure a sustainable future for these economies. Thank you so much. This was extremely rich uh, discussion so far. Let's uh, try to see if we have some questions from uh, from the floor, uh, I give back to Dorina uh, the, or to Rebecca if they would like to 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 get some questions. Or uh, we have st still five minutes. Yes, thank you, everybody. It was really a very interesting discussion to follow. And I hand over to Rebecca. Do we have any questions, Rebecca? Yes, thank you very much, Torina, and thank you to our speakers for this very lively and very interesting discussion. Um, so it seems from what uh, our sp speakers have said today that the quality infrastructure will uh, drastically change in the future. So, um, and I I open the, the floor for anyone who wants to address this question. Um, so what will be needed for quality management and quality managers uh, to keep up with these developments with the increasingly complex systems and the multitude of technologies that now are intervening in the in quality and quality infrastructure? Bernardo, I can say that at the IF level, for example, we have created a working group that uh, supports the different economies and members to follow what's happening around the world. So we have a working group called uh, IF Working Group of Digitalization. This group will follow what's happening around the world and then give guidances to our members. What are the technologies to embrace and conformity assessment? What are the challenges and what are the maybe the uh, better practices or best practices to establish in this field. So at least from accreditation and conformity assessment part for this question, IF and ILAC are trying to give some support to quality managers and people working in this field. 
Thank you so much. Maybe Stefano, you would like to elaborate, especially on the quality manager dimension, because uh, we were talking about how these uh, new challenges are coming. Thank you, Bernardo. Uh, uh, thank you, Bernardo. Yes, uh, the, I think the, the role of the quality manager will evolve, will evolve uh, and will increase in importance in the sense that there will be more and more technology and more uh, embedded into the organizations. And the quality manager is someone who can translate uh, uh, the business need and the process uh, of the organization into the right technology uh, uh, system or application. And I give an example that is uh, quite uh, under the radar right now, but uh, I think it will become more and more uh, interesting in the in the months to come. That is the uh, AI Act is about to be uh, approved by the Parliament of the European Commission, and uh, it will enter into force. We don't know yet when, but it's expected in uh, 2025. And uh, but so in the in the years to come, this the AI Act will be in force. And, uh, and there are conformity assessment procedures uh, required for AI systems. And, um, and AI systems, uh, they are classified as high risk or uh, as incorporating consumer products. And uh, whether one or the other, they will have to follow conformity assessment rules defined by the regulator. And so who will be taking care of that? If not the quality manager that uh, normally will have to take care of the technical files for C marking, he will have the additional responsibility to ensure this compliance to the uh, AI Act. Of course, he will not act alone. He will need to act with the uh, data scientists, uh, data engineers, uh, ethical uh, experts, lawyers. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there will be a, a technical file that will uh, embed uh, requirements from the uh, AI Act and therefore requirements about data quality, data uh, harmonization, ethical, um, human-centric requirements, and, and so forth. So I think there is a great future for quality managers uh, that will uh, invest in developing their digitalization skills. Thank you so much. I think we can afford still one more question from the Q&A. Rebecca? Uh, thank you very much, Bernardo. Uh, so yes, uh, and this uh, builds up upon what uh, Brahim was mentioning before about how the IAF is supporting developing countries with on how to how to embrace this digitalization journey. So one of our colleagues is asking us, um, is actually praising these efforts and saying that this collaboration will help uh, to have a synchronization around the world on digitalization and smart uh, quality infrastructure services. And they are asking if there are any plans to develop, to further develop um, a guideline at the, at, the, at the global level. So um, at the conformity assessment and the accreditation level, IF has uh, part of the tasks of its uh, um, working group is to develop guidances and documents for conformity assessment bodies, laboratories, inspection bodies, and uh, maybe also for specific industries. So this is the task of this working group to work on this level. But uh, at the international level, I think we need to cooperate at INETQI level with the different organizations so we can have harmonized uh, a message around the world and work as much as possible to have the information spread around the world. Yeah, I also completely echo with what Brian has said and it's a good suggestion. Probably we could have collaboration between the different organizations to come out with some kind of guide document because this is going to be the future. Thank you so much. This was really an excellent uh, discussion and I, 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 I really don't feel like I need to, to, to conclude or, or to summarize. First of all, I would like to, to, to thank you personally, uh, Aparna, Roberta, Brahim, Stefano, uh, Dorina, and, and, and all the team, uh, Rebecca, all the team uh, that was behind uh, this. We have an excellent team. And we are also very proud of the team that led to the publication. Uh, we also would like to, to, to thank uh, not only the authors of the publication, the peer reviewers, uh, the designers, all the, 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 the team was behind. It has been an important effort to bring this forward, to bring this webinar and a special thank to our donor. Uh, an important uh, element is to have uh, the financial support also to bring this uh, type of activities to, to an end. It has been a process, SECO, uh, through uh, Switzerland, uh, the government of Switzerland, through the global uh, quality and standards program has supported us to, to finalize a special thank 
for that. And with that, uh, and looking uh, really into the future where we need a collaboration, and I will take that only element, uh, the, the collaboration element, to address uh, the, the challenges and to reap the, the benefits towards uh, people, planet, and prosperity, I give back to Dorina. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Bernardo, and thank you very much to all the speakers. It was really a very good discussion that we had today, and we had a very good participation. So thank you also to all the participants for following our discussion today. Uh, we would like to remind you that the document that was referred to on smart quality infrastructure is available online. So please visit the UNIDO Knowledge Hub under hub.unido.org for uh, viewing the document, but also for any follow-up information and the recording of this session. Thank you very much again from uh, my side. I have nothing more to add and I'd like to uh, close this uh, webinar with a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you everybody. Thanks. Thank you everybody. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Congratulations with Thank the document. You, bye -bye. Yes.